Good evening. Uh, well, I'm glad that you've come tonight. What a lovely day and what a nice evening. So I'm glad you've come out to share in a time of the word. Uh, our text is in the book of Jude. So we're looking at what is the uh, one of the smallest books of the, the New Testament, along with uh, second and third John, which are a little shorter, but the, this is, uh, and Philemon's a short book, but Jude is, though it is short, it is packed full. Uh, and so we're, I'm going to begin reading verse three and go back over some that we've looked at in the last couple of weeks. But uh, as we move on, I want to get the context. So uh, in verse three of, of Jude, he says, beloved, Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Now, uh, just to remind you what Jude is doing here, he's, uh, he's told us that the purpose of his letter changed. He wanted to write about the common salvation, but because he felt like the gospel itself was under attack, that now he's changed his, his subject matter and he's uh, urging us to contend for, and remember we emphasize that it's that definite article, the faith, and it's a faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So we, uh, we're not innovators. We're not trying to come up with something new. We're trying to preserve something old, something that was once for all given to the saints and this is uh, what we preach and teach. And uh, James said that, that uh, this, is, this is what is under attack, that the faith is un under attack from these false teachers. And he characterizes them in uh, seven, he gives seven different examples of the way God opposes these false teachers. And Israel was the first example. So uh, last week we, we talked a great deal about Israel. We looked at 1 Corinthians 10 and Paul there uses Israel as an example. I would also just point out, uh, I, I, keep your finger here, but turn back to Hebrews chapter 3. So I uh, just want to say a little bit more about it so that you, you get the importance of this, that uh, it is possible to look on the outside like you're a genuine believer, like uh, Paul said, the Israelites, remember all our fathers uh, uh, passed through the, the uh, sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate that spiritual food. They all drank from that spiritual rock and that rock that followed them was Christ. But with the majority of them, God was not pleased and they were scattered in the wilderness. And he said, therefore, we shouldn't do what they did. He said, let there not be an, an evil heart of uh, an evil desire in you like there was in them. And he gives us, remember those four sins uh, that we don't uh, practice idolatry, adultery, tempting Christ and complaining, murmuring. He said, these are the four characteristics of, of the, those false believers. And he says, remember, he said, therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. But he told us now, uh, there's, uh, he said, uh, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And God 
is faithful and he will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So Paul uses the example of the Israelites to warn us that it's possible to have everything right on the outside, but to be, remember we talked about that word, a dokimos, to be rejected, to be to not pass the test because we're empty. We don't have genuine faith. I want you to see that the writer to the Hebrews uses the same example of Israel. And he's in chapter three, he's talking about how Jesus is greater than Moses. But he says uh, in verse seven, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, this is Hebrews 3, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they, look at this, always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. He does not say that there was a time that they were straight and then they went astray. He said they always go astray. There was, he does not say there was a time they knew me, but now they don't. He says they have not known my ways. Now, if you were to look at the Israelites alongside the Egyptians, you'd say, and I were to ask you, well, which one of these is the people of God? You'd say, well, the Israelites. But I want you to get what the Bible says is not all of them were. Just because they were descendants of Abraham did not make them saved. That there was, the Bible talks about the remnant within Israel. And this is a, a warning. The writer to the Hebrews gives us warning after warning. Uh, he says, and here he quotes uh, from uh, Psalm 95, uh, this is what this is an extended quote from Psalm 95, and God says in response to their the fact that they have not known His ways, and they always go astray. He says, "As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." Now the writer to the Hebrews takes that, and he he says that uh, the that God didn't allow them to enter the promised land. But then he goes on to say that even those that entered the promised land or didn't necessarily enter God's rest because the psalmist later says that there remains a rest for the, the, the people of God. He's, he, the psalmist uh, says, warns us that we could fail to enter that rest. And so the, these warning passages in Hebrews and in Jude and in 1 Corinthians, uh, they're there for a reason. And that is that when we hear that warning, uh, that it makes us always examine our, ourselves to see if our faith is real, to see that we persevere. Now, I just got back from uh, two days up in New England where I, I and my colleague, Dr. Tom Schreiner, preached through the book of Hebrews in these two days. He'd preach one and then I'd preach one. And Dr. Tom Schreiner has written, I don't know, something like 25 books. I think he's the greatest living New Testament scholar. But he and I had a little bit of a debate while we were up there. At, I mean, we, we knew it ahead of time. It wasn't a surprise. We, we disagree a little bit on uh, exactly the way these warning passages are used. And my take on it is that, uh, that the writers are addressing this to a mixed congregation, if you will, just like I, I'd like to think that everybody who's a member of Buck Run is saved, but the truth is I know better. Uh, we do everything we can to make sure that people join and are baptized or, or join, transfer their membership here are genuine believers. That's why we have a pastoral interview with them and we want to make sure they understand the gospel and we want to explain it to them. But I know people and uh, the first church had 12 members and one of them was lost. And if that was true of Jesus, <laughs> if that was true of the church that he, he started there, you know, it's going to be true of the church I pastor as well. There are, there are always false professors. And so I believe that this is addressed to a, a mixed congregation. And then the warning is to make sure that we examine our faith. Dr. Schreiner's view is that these are addressed uh, to believers 
and that the warning is real. He says that if, if you don't persevere in faith, you will go to hell. Uh, but he believes that it's, that it's addressed only to believers and that the, the warning always has its effect. In other words, he doesn't believe anybody can lose their salvation, but he believes that so as the warning is preached, that the genuine believers heed the warning and they persevere. Uh, my, now, my objection to that, I asked him, so I said, okay, so you admit that there were some who did not persevere, right? I said, did they hear the warning? Were they warned? Well, yes. Well, then they didn't heed the warning and they didn't persevere and they were lost. It's not that they lost their salvation. I'm not saying that. I believe. And here's where, by the way, I think really all evangelicals agree, whether we're Arminian or Calvinist or anywhere in between, we all read the Bible. And the one thing we conclude is that these people who turn their back on God and that they, they don't they, they don't persevere. They don't go to heaven. Uh, now, Arminians believe that they once were genuinely saved and then they were lost again. And we say, no, they were, they were never saved to begin with, but they're lost. And so what we all sort of agree on is that in the end, they're not saved. And we all agree that these warning passages are given to us to make us examine ourselves but the second purpose of these warning passages is given to us so that we examine others. Now, it's not that I'm going around saying, hey, Dave Parks, I'm not sure if you're saved or not. You know, it's, it's, but if Dave Parks came in and he started preaching another gospel, then, oh, I, would I question his salvation? If he starts saying there's another way of salvation or, uh, and we've, we've, we've seen this. I, I told you the story of my former friend who's now a Druid and teaches in a neo-pagan seminary. I, I can only conclude if he, if he persists in that, if he does not repent, that he never was born again. And so these warnings are given not only for me to examine myself, but for me to examine the teaching of others. So if someone teaches that there's another way of salvation, if someone says that, well, uh, we're all trying to get to the same place. And, you know, some of us are going through Jesus and some of us are going through Buddha and some of us, uh, of us are going through Muhammad. Well, I would, then I would object to that. I would say, no, that's, that's another gospel. So this is why these warnings are given to us. And when you read through Hebrews, so much of Hebrews is a warning. So much of first Corinthians is a warning. The epistles warn us of people like uh, Diotrephes and Hymenaeus and Alexander and Paul calls them by name. John says in first John that he, he speaks of these people collectively. And he said, they went out from us, but they were not of us for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. So what's John saying? He said, the proof that they don't stay with the gospel is the evidence that they never were really one of us to begin with. And so these warning passages are, are important. And it, it's really important that those of us who believe in the doctrine of eternal security uh, or perseverance of the saints, where it's really sort of two aspects of the same doctrine, but it's important that we never present that in such a way that, it, that we make people think that, yeah, once you walk an aisle and and profess your faith in Jesus that it doesn't matter what you do, you'll go to heaven anyway. The Bible definitely does not teach that. Uh, and we should all see that, 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 that we are urged to persevere. This is why Paul himself said that I beat my body daily. I, I bring it under subjection, lest I myself having preached to others should be a docimos. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. And here, this is one of the most difficult passages in all of the, the New Testament. But I, I'm going to sort of look down at verse 4. He says, uh, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, 
and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since, or I say while, they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Now, I want to stop right there and just point out to you, he, he's talking here about somebody. Now, he, this is the big debate in this passage. Is he talking about someone who is genuinely saved, and then they fall away? Now, my friend Dr. Schreiner says that he's, he's talking about believers. And if you if you read this description, it sure sounds like believers, doesn't it? Those who have, in verse 4, who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. Well, that sounds like a description of saved people. But then it says, and, and then falling away, it's impossible for you to renew them to repentance. So is, is what's in view here that a, if a, a person is saved and then they fall away, they can never be saved again. And that's one view that some people hold. But I don't, I don't believe he's talking about people who are genuinely saved. To me, the whole flow of the book, just like we looked there in chapter three, he's talking about Israel and not all of them are genuinely saved. He said they, they have always gone astray. He said, you know, they uh, that they never had uh, followed him. And God swore, they shall not enter my rest. Uh, and you, as you read through it, uh, this seems to, to me to be the, the importance of that book of Hebrews, that he's, the question is whether or not we're genuine believers. So is it possible that a, a lost person, could it be said of a lost person that those who have, that someone has, once been enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit and tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come? Could that be true of a lost person? I'm going to argue yes. And I'm going to, let me, let me just show you a few of them in the, in the Bible. Uh, turn over to the book of, all right, now, so we're just, I know we're going around a little bit, but we want to get in our minds what Jude is saying, why he's warning us about these false teachers who look like they're saved. They're preaching almost the gospel. So in the book of Acts chapter eight, Philip has been preaching up at uh, Samaria and a bunch of people start to get saved. And one of them is a magician. His name is Simon. And it says, uh, in Acts chapter 8, uh, verse 9, there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. Well, I know a lot of people who fit that description, right? And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself, look at this word, believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, <clears throat> he was amazed. Now, look at that. It says Simon believed and was baptized. Does that mean he was saved? Well, normally I think it would, but is, do we ever have in the Bible the case of someone who believes and is not saved? Yeah, the demons. The de you know, remember what James says, you believe there's one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. So we all know there's a difference in head 
belief and heart belief. There's a difference in acknowledging the facts and committing one's life. And Simon hears the facts and, and he believes. I mean, but now why does it go into all this stuff about his background? He's a magician. He's been a, a sorcerer in essence. And he sees them with this power. And man, it's greater than any power he's ever had. So he believes that. He's won over by their signs and wonders. He believes and he's baptized and he continues with Philip. But, verse 14, now when the, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. For your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond, bondage of iniquity. Now, that's a pretty good description of a lost person, isn't it? You don't have any part or lot in this matter. What, in the Holy Spirit, you, your heart's not right before God. You're in the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity. And yet, he has intellectually believed. He's been, a, he has, I would argue that he's tasted of the, the, the powers of the age to come, of the, of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's seen this. He's had an experience in the same way that the children of Israel coming up out of Egypt they had an experience. God did the miracles. He parted the water for them. He gave them manna from heaven and water from the rock. If that's not experiencing the power of the age to come, I, I don't know what is. That's, that's an incredible thing. I've never experienced any of that. But they did. But they were lost. And Simon did. And he was lost. And, and do you think when God gave, when God gave the the apostles, the power to go out into the surrounding cities and to heal the sick. And he sent them out. Do you think Judas had the power that the others had? Well, I think he did. Because nobody's going, hey, we can all do this, but that guy can't. Do we see in the Bible, is there ever unbelievers that have a special power like that? Well, Jannies and Jamborees. <laughs> The magicians in Pharaoh's court, they can do the miracles that Moses can do, but it, their power doesn't come from God. In the same way, I believe Judas is given that power because he's in the office of an apostle. He doesn't, he doesn't stick out as unable to do what the others are able to do. Uh, he's in every way like them, except for one. He's lost. And miracles are never a proof Never proof that the person doing them is saved. You see miracles in the Bible. Remember, there are going to be some that appear before Jesus and they're going to say, hey, didn't we do many mighty works in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me. What's he call them? Workers of iniquity. I once knew you, but now I no longer do. Is that what he says? He says, I never knew you. Now, if they could do mighty deeds in the name of Jesus, if they could cast out demons in the name of Jesus, if you, were, uh, if you and I were watching them, I think most of us would sort of assume, well, they're real believers. But Jesus is going to expose them on the day of judgment that they weren't. Remember, Jesus said to them, when they came back, when they came back after he sent them out, the disciples are saying, 
wow, even the demons are subject to our name. And what did Jesus say? Don't rejoice in this. That's not the thing. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. And Jesus tells them to prioritize salvation over working miracles because it's possible to work miracles without being saved. And that is the thing Jesus said we should rejoice over. So you see it in Simon. I think you see it in Judas. I think you see it in the children of Israel. Uh, these are people who had experiences and they had certain uh, powers, but they did not have genuine saving faith. And that is, that's what we're warned about, that we don't put our faith in the miracle, that we don't put our faith in, you know, uh, it's like I've told you many times, Esau and Jacob, Esau gets his own country. He gets all these flocks and herds and children and, and servants. Jacob lives in a tent. He never gets the thing that God had promised him while he was alive. For Hebrews eleven thirteen. these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them from afar. If we were to look at Esau with all of his blessings of his own country and children and wealth, and we see Jacob living in a tent, which one do you think we're going to say, well, man, God blessed this guy. This is his favorite. And that would be a false assumption because Jacob is the child of promise. Jacob is the one on whom God sets his affection, not Esau. So the, the warning here is that we, we can't put our trust in these external things over and over. This is, this is throughout scripture. Back in Hebrews chapter six, one more thing there, and we'll go back to Jude. Uh, I want you to see, remember last week we talked about the word of Dokimos, and I, I told you about the coin and when it gets defaced or you can't tell if it's a slug or a coin and the shopkeeper would say a document was he rejected. It, I don't take it. Now look back in Hebrews chapter six. Uh, after he goes through this about, about these that I, I believe he's talking here about false, false believers. And he's saying it's impossible for you to renew them again to repentance while they are staying in that sin, while they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. And that is, I think, by their lack of faith. Now look, look at the comparison he makes. Verse 7, for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is, it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. All right, what's the blessing of the land that receives rain and, and sunshine and nourishment? What, is, what does that land do? It brings forth fruit. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed. Now that word uh, cursed, guess what word that is? A dokimos. It's rejected. It's, it does not pass the test. How do you know which land receives the blessing of God? By what it produces. One produces fruit, one produces thorns and thistles. This is, isn't this what Jesus said? He said uh, that by their fruits you shall know them. Uh, a bad tree can't produce good fruit. And he says, this is what you do. You examine their fruit. And so the warning here is that we look and see, so what's the evidence of our salvation? And it's that we produce fruit for the Lord. We, and the Bible tells us all kinds of different fruit that a believer produces, the fruit of the spirit for one, uh, the fruit of, of salvation. That is, I think that but we, we, we live like a saved person. Our desire, remember Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, when he says, therefore, after he tells us about those Israelites, he says, therefore, do not desire evil like they did. So there are many different evidences of salvation. Now, some people, some of you might be going, okay, now just a minute. 
Pastor, you're telling us then that we can't really have assurance of salvation because with all these warning passages that tell us, you know, make sure that you're saved. Well, how can, how can we know we're saved? Well, remember it's, it's a both and, it's not an either or. But let's just, does the Bible teach that you can know you're saved? It does. It says, 1 Corinthians 5, 13, these things are written unto you that you may believe on the name of the Son of God and that you may know that you have eternal life. So the Bible says you can know. But let me ask you, when have you had doubts? Have you ever had doubts about your salvation? Have you ever said, man, maybe I'm not saved? When was it? I'll tell you when it was. It was typically when there was sin in your life. Whenever we allow sin in our lives, that's when we go, oh, I'm, I'm no, I don't know, I'm saved. And sin does rob you of your assurance. And on one level, it should. Assurance is really, when we're talking about assurance of salvation, that functions on two levels. There's the assurance of what God has said. But then there's sort of the assurance that is our subjective feeling. So there's the objective truth. God has said, if you believe on the name of the Son of God, you will have everlasting life. That's what God says. So, the, so here's my question. Do you believe on the name of the Son of God? Do you really believe? Have you committed your life? Not, not the Simon kind of belief where you believe the fact or you want the power, or you don't want to go to hell, but saying, I believe Jesus died for me. I've called upon him for salvation. And if you've called upon the Lord and you believed on Jesus, you've committed your life to him, you can absolutely rest assured you're going to heaven. But when you allow sin into your life, suddenly that's when Satan comes along and here's what he goes. He says, now look at you. How could a saved person do that? And that's when you go, oh, I'm not so sure I'm saved. And because you start asking that question. If I'm saved, how did I do that? If I'm saved, why did I lose my temper like that? If I'm saved, how did I mess up? Why do I struggle with lust? Why do I, why am I greedy? Whatever your besetting sin may be, that's what Satan uses to bring doubt into your life. Does that change the objective reality, the objective truth of whether or not you're saved? No, that's just your feeling. And Satan's going to mess with your feelings and your feelings will lie to you. You can't trust your feelings. Are there lost people who feel like they're saved? There are. Are there saved people who feel like they're lost? There are. So it's not about your feelings. I don't, you know, there are days I don't feel very much in love with Tanya. But what I have learned is that's irrelevant. That my love is an act of my will and it's a, it's a decision, a choice. It's not a feeling. It's a decision to love her. And if I acted on my feelings, man, it, it would not be good. That's true about every area of my life. I mean, how many Monday mornings you just feel like going to work? Uh, you know, when do you, when does a wife feel like submitting to her husband? When does a husband feel like loving his wife, like Christ loved the church? Th those aren't things that are based on feelings. These are commands. They're an act of our will. And so what you've got to do is say, my feelings are irrelevant. What matters is what the word of God says. God said, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God has said that as a promise. And I know that I'm believing in Jesus. My desire is not to use that as an excuse for sin. I'm, I'm not treating that lightly. When I sin, I, I, I grieve over it. I hate my sin. I wish I could, I wish I could wave a wand and be done with my sin. I'm not using the, the grace of God as a, as an excuse to sin. Uh, and when you examine your heart in the light of the word of God, you can know you're saved, but it's not a feeling. I will tell you, the most devout Christian is at times going to feel like he's not saved. I, you know, I've, I've told all of you to read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. 
if you really want to, you know, that's, that's college. You want to get a PhD in Bunyan? Read Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And it's awful. I don't mean it's awful. To, it's, it's well written. I mean, Bunyan in that it tells how he wrestled with whether or not he was saved for so long and how he agonized over it. And this is why in Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan has two events in there where, uh, where you're like, does Christian get saved here uh, or does he get saved here when he releases the burden of his sins? And Bunyan talks about that struggle. I mean, there, he, there's a difference in when he was saved and when he really realized that the impact of that, sin, that salvation was to get rid of the, of the guilt of his sin. So your assurance is guaranteed by God, but that doesn't mean you're always going to feel saved. So don't, don't, don't trust your feelings. Look to the word of God. And what does the word of God say? Well, examine your, your fruit. What's the fruit of your life? Because those that are, uh, those that are receiving the blessing of God and salvation, they're going to bring forth fruit. And those that are cursed, that is, they don't have salvation, they're going to, they're bringing forth thistles and briars. And so this is why Jude is concerned with this. We're to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And that means that we have to mark those whose lives don't bear fruit. And the fruit with which Jude is most concerned is, is the message of the gospel that we preach. Now, back to the book of Jude. Uh, we've spent a good deal of time about, uh, about his first example here of Israel. The second example that he gives are the fallen angels, verse 6. The angels uh, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. All right, so he's going to give us seven examples. And the first one is Israel, that not all of those that came out of Egypt were, were genuinely saved. Uh, and now the second example is the, the angels. So God creates a race of angels and how many of them are fallen? Anybody know? One third. Now, do, or, do you remember where that is? Well, you, 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 you answered correctly. It is one third. And we know this from Revelation chapter 12 and verse four, where uh, we're told there that, so this is, remember uh, if you were in our Revelation study, that this is a, a view of history. And uh, as the story of the woman and the dragon is told, uh, this is, that's the story of Satan's attempt to destroy the promised seed of the woman. And uh, so the, John here tells us about this great dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and on his head, seven diadems. Verse four, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. So there's a, 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 a picture of how Satan was able in some way, we don't know details and <coughs> be wary of the people who give you more details than the Bible gives you. I don't know how that happened. I don't know when that happened, but I know that it happened that somehow Satan gets one third of the angels of heaven to rebel with him. And when they do, their future is now certain. It is guaranteed. Now the Bible refers to the angels as elect angels and fallen angels or demons, fallen angels, demons, uh, devils. Uh, it's, it's all the same. And those that did not fall are called the elect angels or the holy angels. But we know that one third of them fell. And when they did, there's no salvation for them. They are reserved in chains of darkness. Jesus describes this in another way. When the, when the 70 come back in Luke chapter 10 and verse, uh, I forget that's back there, verse 18, uh, they come back. Uh, Jesus says, I beheld 
Satan fall as lightning from heaven, as the kingdom of, of uh, God is announced and goes into uh, other regions, Jesus sees this as part of his cosmic battle with Satan. And of course, God wins. Jesus wins. He's going to defeat uh, Satan. Uh, but this battle began with this revolt of the angels. One third of them fell. But when they did, they are, it says that they are, they left their proper dwelling. They, they did not stay within their position of authority. Now, what's a position of authority? Remember when the, the Roman centurion comes to Jesus and he says, my servant is dying. Uh, could you heal my servant? Jesus says, let's go. He said, oh no, you don't need to go. And then he says this, I'm a man under authority. I say to this man, you go do that and he does it. And I say to this one, you go do that and he does it. If you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, wow, <laughs> I've not found faith like that in all of Israel. Here's a Gentile who, who gets it. And the, all, all of Israel doesn't get it like that. This guy gets it. Uh, and it's always fascinated me. I think most people would say, I'm a man in authority. And I say to that guy, do it. And he does it. But notice, listen to what the centurion says. I'm a man under authority. Um, I see Leroy's wearing his Screaming Eagles 101st patch on his shirt over there. Military guys know what that means. The only way a military officer can give a command to those in his command is he's under the authority of somebody over him. If he steps out of the authority over him, he's going to lose the authority to tell those under him what to do. It's about being in the chain of command. And this is what the centurion says to Jesus, because I'm in the chain of command, because I'm under authority, I have authority. And because you're under the authority of God, you have authority to say to my servant to rise and be healed and it'll happen. And so these, these angels are under God's authority and because of that, they have certain authority. But when they rebelled, they weren't, they weren't happy to stay in the chain of authority. They wanted a different authority. They didn't want to re be under the authority of God. They rebelled. And so what is the punishment? They didn't stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. So he is kept in chains, eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So they're in the spiritual darkness. The same way the Bible can speak of your glorification in the past tense, those whom he justified, he is also glorified. He can speak of the judgment of these fallen angels as they are already reserved in chains, eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the day of judgment. So their, their judgment is absolutely certain. And this is why we know that we Christians are not under the authority of demons. You can give place to the devil, but that's an act of your will. You don't have to worry about demon possession. You don't have to worry about demonic influence. A Christian is not under the authority of the devil. You have authority over the devil. And uh, God's given you that authority because you're under the authority of Jesus. And you don't, a lot of times Christians worry about demon possession. You don't need to worry about that because you have authority over the demons. And God has promised you that. But these that have fallen, they're reserved in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of that great day. And then the third example is Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a, a, a punishment of eternal fire. So the third example 
are, is God's judgment. So he's given us examples of God's judgment. First judgment is on those that were Israelites, but were not genuine believers. Second example of God's judgment are the fallen angels. The third, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you'll read from those that want to uh, def argue that homosexuality is not sin, that Sodom and Gomorrah's great sin is that it's not merely that it was homosexuality, but that it was abusive homosexuality and that they were inhospitable. Well, there's no question they were abusive and they were inhospitable, but there's no, also no question that the Bible characterizes that this as their sin. Now, uh, let's, let's remember, Jesus said the sin of Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida was worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. So I'm not saying that that's the worst sin in the Bible. It's clearly not, but God did judge them. And it says it characterizes this as sexual immorality and that they pursued unnatural desire. So it's not merely abusive sex. It is an, uh, the word that Jude uses is unnatural desire. And they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So he said, the illusion here is that God rained fire and brimstone down on them, but that was just the temporary judgment. There's an eternal judgment that God gives as well. Now, if you look at these three examples, here's Israel. And these are people who are on the outside supposed to be God's people. The second example are those that were created as holy angels. God judged Israel. God judged the holy angels. He judged Sodom and Gomorrah. They were not Jews. They were not followers of his. They certainly weren't like holy angels. But in each case, God's judgment was absolutely certain. And he says, in the same way, verse 8, in the same way, these people also, these false teachers, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, what is that about? Well, that's where we'll pick up next week, and I'll tell you. All right? So, uh, I will not be here next week, but I will teach by video. So, there'll be a video next week, and it'll still feel the same. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together in the Word. And I pray that indeed we might hear the warning of Scripture, that it might not frighten us, but it might make us soberly think about the reality of our salvation and at the same time give us comfort because the same Word that gives us the warning gives us the assurance that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We rest in that. We trust that. Help us to share the message of the gospel, even while we contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We thank you for your word, for the witness of your spirit, for the fruit that the lives of your children bear. May the witness of the word, the spirit, the fruit in our lives all point to the reality of our faith. In Jesus we pray. Amen.